Canadians like to point to the many differences between us and our neighbors to the south, but beyond our pronunciation of about and our propensity to say sorry, there is one more difference to add to that list, our relationship to governments and what that means to life in a Canadian surveillance state. Joining us now for more on this, Jonathan Kay, National Post columnist and the author of Among the Truthers. Hi, Jonathan Kay, welcome back. That's a great long subtitle. Among the Truthers, a journey into the growing conspiracist underground of 9-11 truthers, birthers, Armageddonites, vaccine hysterics, Hollywood know-nothings, and internet addicts. I feel like I've read the whole book. Now. Yeah, well, in, in a way you have. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a descent into all of those conspiracist subcultures. Well, let's just get into this a little bit because this book came out a couple of years ago. And, of course, with the NSA revelations, I'm wondering what, what impact that has had on the people who are in the pages of this book. Well, the people who I profile in the book, conspiracy theorists, you know, they required no encouragement to believe that the government was, was spying on them. And then they got it. And they got the proof, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has had a lot of effect on people who aren't conspiracy theorists, who just simply have woken up to the fact that, uh, since 9-11 especially, the government is surveilling ordinary people, not just people who are suspected of criminality or terrorism. Uh, this is the post-9-11 normal. Have you heard, though, from people who you may have chronicled in the book who get back to you now after the NSA revelations come out and say, aha, you see? I told you so. I have, and it's important to concede that a lot of these conspiracy theories, they have a grain of truth, truth to them, um, and especially since 9-11, because 9-11, the social contract really did shift, and a lot of citizens basically said to the government, you do what you have to to protect us. And there's a certain amount of hypocrisy uh, 12 years later, people saying, wait a sec, I didn't know that this included actually paying attention to my phone and email metadata. You know, I meant to surveil other people. Um, but that was the social contract people signed on to after 9-11. People want the government to protect them. What do you think the status of that social contract is today? Well, I think it's pretty much as it was on September 12th, 2001. Because, Still? Well, I think there's a lot of civil libertarians, there's a lot of journalists, there's a lot of intellectuals, there's a lot of academics who are up in arms about the abstract concept of civil liberties. But what tends to happen is your average person on the street, uh, they are more interested in simply being protected. And that's one phenomenon. The other phenomenon, which I don't think was as prevalent in 9-11, but is, is a huge factor now, is that people have gotten used to civil liberties incursions from their smartphones. You know, when mm -hmm. I turn on my smartphone, and I turn on, say, a shopping app or a map app, and it says, can I use your location data? A couple of years ago, I used to kind of think about that. Now, I don't even think about that anymore. You just say yes. I just say, yeah, you know, tell me where the nearest uh, Canadian tire is. Uh, you know, here's where I am. You know, here, here's my name. Here's my birthday. People don't think about that anymore. And that's something that, uh, that wasn't so much the case a few years ago. But now, most Canadians, most Canadian adults have smartphones. And all of those smartphones are enabled with geo-tracking software. Mm. And most people enable it because it's convenient. You saw what happened to the sales of uh, George Orwell's 1984? Absolutely through the roof. Apparently, after the NSA story came out, 7,000% spike of sales on Amazon.com. How does Orwell's novel reflect how conspiracy theorists think about the world? Well, I think conspiracy theorists tend to see the world in that dystopian way. They, but the key thing is that they don't just see the government as surveilling them. They see the government as surveilling them for a nefarious purpose. And that's why the word, the word Orwellian is, is somewhat, I think, it's not appropriate to what governments like in Canada, the United States, uh, Western Europe, what, what they're doing. Because, yes, they're using all these high-tech tools to surveil us, but they're not necessarily doing it for a nefarious purpose. It doesn't have that pejorative tint to it. Well, they're not trying to oppress us. We live in basically open societies, which means that, yes, the government has all this information about us, but there's still an independent judiciary. There's still an independent media. There's still all these independent outlets that we can go to for redress if the government is treating us badly. That's obviously not the case in totalitarian societies, and it's not the case in the world that George Orwell sk sketched out in 1984. Well, they would say, says you. Right. Says you we have these yeah. independent observers who are there to also watch our civil liberties in case the government gets out of hand. I'm not sure, they, I'm not sure they're with you on that one. You know? And again, there's always a grain of truth to every uh, conspiracy theory. And I think you could point to the United States and say, look at the FISA courts. You know, the FISA courts were set up in the 1970s. These were supposed to be the, the aspect of the judiciary which helped Americans um, strike a balance between civil liberties and security. And if the government wanted to get a warrant on someone, they could go to a FISA court. That's an acronym for uh, 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 Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Authority Act, or something Act, like that. Act, Act. okay. Mm -hmm. And um, what happens is we now know from the NSA story that 
those powers have been abused, and because those are not entirely open processes, the government in some cases have sort of used the FISA pr proceedings as a sort of rubber stamp. Do you think this kind of conspiratorial thinking, though, poses some kind of danger to society at large? Uh, I think it does when you're looking at certain issues. Um, the example I, I give, for instance, is how can Americans have an intelligent debate about health care when you have a significant percentage of the population that believes Obamacare is some kind of Nazi-like plot to deprive mm -hmm. people of their, their health and send grandma before a death panel and that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. uh, how can you have an intelligent debate about 9-11 when you have people who think it was an inside job? And I think you're seeing an example of that to a certain extent with global warming. I no longer am able to have intelligent conversations about global warming with many people because they believe that all of the major scientific bodies, that governments, that academia, that it's all part of some grand conspiracy mm -hmm. to convince people that global warming is a hoax so that we can turn on some kind of nefarious environmental agenda and strip the world of industry and that sort of thing. You know, global warming is a huge, huge issue. But even in Canada, which is not as conspiratorial minded as the United States, it's becoming increasingly impossible to have any kind of intelligent dialogue about it because you have people on both sides of the spectrum locked mm -hmm. into extreme and sometimes conspiratorial positions. You say in Canada we're less into it than in the United States. Uh, it, well, that is empirically the case, isn't it? Definitely. Why definitely is it the case? the case? Well, the United States was uh, basically created uh, in its revolutionary period in a uh, reaction to what many patriots regarded as a conspiracy to suppress the freeborn rights of American yeomen. Uh, they, you know, the uprising against the British was very much couched in anti-conspiratorial tones. And it's, it's completely true that the British really were trying to take away the guns and gunpowder of American revolutionaries. When, when you have Second Amendment fans in the United States talking about how this is our revolutionary right to have guns, that, that, that it's true. The revolution was very much born as a right to bear arms revolution. And that's something that simply doesn't exist in Canada. So we don't look around, it's not part of our political DNA to look at foreign conspirators who are trying to oppress us in the way that American revolutionaries were steeped in that culture when they created their country. Uh, the second thing is we're just not as religious a country. And if you look at a lot of conspiratorial themes in the United States, a lot of them are wound up with evangelical end times prophecies and uh, Armageddon uh, myths, that sort of thing. So a lot of the political conspiracy theories you see in the United States are essentially just secular adaptations of end times notions of good versus evil. Um, and we don't have as much of that in Canada. It's interesting. I said to Wesley Wark earlier in the program, I said they're about the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we're about the peace order and good government and have been for almost 150 years. And that may help explain why we seem to be less conspiratorial and more trusting. And I think part of his response was, and we talked about it uh, a bit after, part of his response was, well, you should still verify anyway. No. Don't be so trusting of government authorities anyway. That's a good way to live, isn't it? It's absolutely true that citizens need to be vigilant and they need to set up structures to make sure that the government isn't running unchecked. And I think there, are, you know, it's a fair criticism of the Harper government that to a certain extent, they have tried to dismantle some of the checks and balances that exist in our system of government. And we, we have to be vigilant about that. But by and large, I agree with your assessment, Canadians are not conspiratorially minded. And if you, actually, if you look at Canadian conspiracy theorists, who I studied in the book, most of their conspiracy mongering is oriented toward US conspiracies. Mm -hmm. So they're not really that interested in Canadian conspiracies because they're sort of boring. Uh, they're more interested in what's going on in Washington and New York than they are with what's going on in Ottawa. There are obviously a ton of south of the border conspiracies that have captured the imagination. But can you give us an example of a Canadian conspiracy that, while not in the, you know, in the league of JFK or 9-11, might be something we'd have heard of? Most Canadian conspiracies that traffic in the, uh, traffic in the internet in the last uh, few years, they generally have to do with this Canadian obsession with losing sovereignty to the United States. So uh, especially whenever there's any kind of free trade deal negotiated, uh, a huge theme among Canadian conspiracy theorists is that the people who are negotiating the deal are secretly negotiating to somehow merge Canada and the United States and destroy Canadian sovereignty. That tends to be the big theme in especially left-wing Canadian conspiracy mongering. 
And uh, where are we here? 25 years? Are we 25 years? Yeah, 25 years after the free trade, uh, the, uh, free trade agreement was signed. What do you think the record on that is? Uh, well, we're still very much sovereign, but I'm going to plug a colleague's book. Diane Francis, my National Post colleague, has a new book coming out urging the merger of Canada and the United States. So there is some movement on that. Front. Really? Yeah. We got to get her in that chair. Yeah. Well, you know, that's uh, now one... you've piqued my curiosity. I want to. What does she want to call this new country? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm going to make people buy the book. Uh, <laughs> I, there might be some sort of write-in contest uh, that's uh, tagged to this. Yeah. It's not the first time somebody's come forward with that. I know there was somebody from the New York Times who wrote a book a while ago, talking about merging Canada, the United States, and Mexico into one, and having a certainly a, a currency union, the Amero. Yes. We talked about that. And she's talking about full-blown one country. Yeah, and I'm wondering what the uh, U.S. Republicans would think about this idea, because presumably the new country would have uh, one-tier uh, Medicare <laughs> for everybody. So, you know, it'd be interesting what the southern governors would think about that They project. would go out of their minds. It would be an interesting yeah. political debate. Okay, Canada's NSA, which we've been talking about on the program, CSEC, some of its surveillance operations have been revealed, but certainly not to the extent of anything that we've seen south of the border. If, if... I know it's a big if because we tend not to traffic in this, but if we had our own version of the NSA Edward Snowden leaks, what do you imagine the reaction in Canada would be? I think it would be very muted. And to a certain extent, we've already seen this because a couple of months ago, the Globe and Mail had a big front page story where they revealed something of this, something of Canada's uh, embryonic equivalent to the NSA. And the reaction was a dull thud, dull thud. Even at the National Post where there's a few libertarians around, uh, you know, I have a colleague there who's libertarian-minded, and he made a fuss about it. He wrote a column about it. But otherwise, Canadians don't seem to mind being watched and listened to. By their own government. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a creepy quality we have. That, Although uh, CSEC is, we hasten to add, not spying on us, we're told. We're told, yeah. but it has all these high-tech powers mm -hmm. that, of course, eventually do pose a threat to civil liberties. But as I say, Canadians don't seem to be that concerned by it. Part of this is our political culture. Part of it, I think, is just we're a wired nation, and a, surveys show that a lot of people who are on their phones on the internet, they already just kind of assume that their stuff is being monitored anyway. anyway. I wonder if that's the scariest conclusion that we come to after all is said and done with this, is that we just assume that the new normal is, there's no such thing as privacy, everything's out there, so suck it up. And a lot of it has to do with labor law because there's a lot of prominent cases where people get fired based on stuff they use workplace computers for. So a lot of us, we're not even that interested in what the government knows about us. We're more focused on what our employers know about us based on what we're doing with our employer-provided smartphone. So we're not even at the level of civil liberties regarding the government. We're more at the level of just not getting fired. So just finally then, in our last 30 seconds, you've written the book, you've thought a lot about this. Do you think we ought to be more exercised about all those eyes in the skies looking at us? I think we have to be exercised about making sure that no government has unchecked power. And given the increasing power of the PMO here in Canada, and given the way we've defanged some of the independent watchdogs in Ottawa who formerly had some sort of uh, independent power base uh, in our nation's capital, I think there are grounds to at least be skeptical of some of the encroachments on our civil liberties that are coming out of our national government. I don't have enough time left to read the subtitle of your book, so I will just simply say Jonathan Kay, author of Among the Truthers. Thank you for coming into TVO tonight. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.